It is a privilege to be with you on this Lord's Day as we continue to worship now through the Word. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and to open to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 will be our focus today. It is a privilege to be here as a guest at Countryside Bible and to be here in the pulpit of Tom Pennington. I consider to be a friend in the ministry and of course to be among friends And so it is a privilege indeed to worship with you. Luke chapter 3, you can read along with me and follow with me as I read aloud. This is the word of the living God. And it reads as follows. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, And his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, when Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. In the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. May God add blessing to the reading and the preaching of his word, if you would join me in prayer at this time. O God, now we bow before your majestic throne, praising you and thanking you for this grand opportunity once again to be gathered on the first day of the week on the Lord's Day, gathered under the banner of the gospel in the name of Jesus, the one who suffered and bled and died for us. We come now to this time of worship through the word, and we ask that you would strengthen us, encourage us in the faith, build us up. May we be strengthened according to your word, for we understand and believe that your word is indeed true. We ask that you would encourage your church and that you would save unbelievers who might be here today. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. A number of years ago, I was leading a group of individuals on a church history tour, a Reformation church history tour through Germany, and we were able to travel to various different sites to see various different locations that were noteworthy throughout church history, including standing at the front of the castle church door in Wittenberg, where Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses. And then we were able to go to the end of that road to where there's the Luther Oak, a massive tree, where it was stated that Luther gathered a group of theology students, and he read the papal bull, which was a letter that was sent to him from the Pope that was demanding that he repent and recant of his writing and his preaching. And not only did Luther open that letter, and not only did he read it, but he burned it publicly in protest of the Roman Catholic Church. We were able to travel to the city of Worms where we stood in the very place where Luther stood on trial before the imperial guard and the leadership that was calling for his repentance and his uh, public repentance and for him to recant of his writing and preaching of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And where he stood and said that he refused to recant, that he could not. And yet, then we also traveled to the Wartburg Castle where Luther would be taken by a group of friends where he would hide out and he would translate the Bible into the German language. And then I would preach in the pulpit in Eisleben where Luther preached his final sermon before he died. This was a wonderful trip and the culmination at the very end, we arrived back in Amsterdam and had a day or so before we 
uh, would fly back home, and it was during that time where some of us would go to the Rijksmuseum, and we would see the wonderful artwork on display. And in that museum, if you've ever been there, you will remember that hanging in that museum on the wall is a very famous piece of art by Rembrandt that is titled The Night Watch. We gathered in a panoramic display there, a group of us around this massive portrait on the wall, and we were hearing an explanation by the tour guide of all of the intricate details of this art on the wall. And you could see all the different pieces and the background and what this meant and that. And after a few minutes, honestly, I just started to zone out. So I just walked away from the back and eased into an adjacent room to see if there was anything else that was interesting in the side room. And on the wall, there was a specific small little portrait that caught my attention, and I started to walk a bit closer. And as I got closer, it was the picture of a young woman, a painting, and she was holding a platter, and on that platter was the head of a man. I started to read, and it was, of course, it was none other than Herodias's daughter who was holding a platter with the head of John the Baptist. And as I walked through the rest of that museum, that portrait, that painting was there in my mind, and it was a reminder of the reality that it is not safe to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. It is not safe to stand and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, yes, we in America have been shielded from persecution and open persecution, state-sponsored persecution against the church of Jesus. We're starting to see more persecution come against the church even in America today. But needless to say, historically, around the world, even to this very day, it is not safe to stand and to preach Jesus. It is not safe to stand and to follow after Jesus. And yet, in this text of Scripture that is before us, we see the unveiling of this passage here, this really the unveiling of John the Baptist's ministry, and we don't have time to unpack all of John the Baptist's ministry, what it's stating here about him in Luke chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6 today. But suffice it to say that John the Baptist was a dangerous man. John the Baptist was a dangerous man. He was willing to stand and to proclaim and to proclaim an unpopular message. And he was willing to preach in an unpopular way, with an unpopular posture, and with an unpopular authority. And as I preach these six verses this morning, I want you to be asking yourself this question, are you a safe individual or are you a dangerous individual as it pertains to the present evil age in which you live? Politically speaking, as far as the world's ideologies that are so prevalent and popular today, are you considered safe, just going with the flow? Or are you considered someone who is a dangerous individual, one who's willing to take an unpopular stand and to preach an unpopular message for the glory of God? If you'll give your attention now to God's Word here in Luke chapter number 3 in verses 1 and 2, you see the prophet John the Baptist and you see the setting of his ministry. There's a list of names here provided for us, historical context is important to understand the backdrop of John the Baptist's ministry. You'll notice, you'll see the name of Tiberius. He was a vile man. In fact, he was a pedophile. He was a horrific individual. You will see also the name of Pontius Pilate. This is the spineless governor who was overseeing the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And then there's another name, a couple of names, Herod Antipas and Philip, his brother. These are individuals who are connected to the family of Herod the Great. It's important when studying the Bible to understand not only the context, but also the historic figures that are mentioned because they are there on purpose. Not every James in the New Testament is the half-brother of Jesus. Not every Mary in the New Testament is the mother of Jesus. And not every Herod is Herod the Great, And specifically here, you see the differentiation of these individuals, although connected to Herod the Great, and it's important 
for us to understand as it pertains to John the Baptist's ministry. Herod the Great was a horrible, a horrible figure. He was a feared man. He was, he was a ruthless leader. And you'll remember, of course, he was the individual who was slaughtering the children in attempt to kill Jesus because he felt that his throne was threatened. Now, when he died, he split up the region of his power for three specific regions for his three sons, namely Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, and Herod Agrippa. Now, Herod Antipas would marry the daughter of another king, and this was, of course, a political maneuver which was intended to be political for this young ruler, and his brother Philip would marry his half-brother's daughter. So you can start to see the perversion of this family obviously connected to Herod the Great. And then you would find as you continue to study Herod's family, you see that Herod Antipas and his brother's wife Herodias would get together in this relationship of adultery, sexual misconduct and perversion, planning to divorce their spouses and come together. That did not work out well, and so they ended up living together in an open relationship of open adultery and sexual misconduct. And so it is, this is the backdrop in which John the Baptist is raised up for public ministry. There's a couple of additional names here at the beginning. You'll see Annas and Caiaphas. These are references to the high priests. And these were the first two Jewish names mentioned here. And yet, these are wicked, vile, horrific leaders that represent in many ways the condition of the Jewish leadership, specifically the religious leadership of the day in which Jesus' earthly ministry comes to fulfillment. This is the backdrop, if you will, of John the Baptist's ministry. You'll notice here in the text of Scripture that you find his name John mentioned. Again, not all of the Johns mentioned in the New Testament wrote the gospel according to John, uh, nor are all the Johns mentioned in the New Testament. John the Baptist, these are different individuals, and they're certainly different from also John Mark, and so you need to know the, the different Johns, the different Marys, the different James, the different Herods when you're studying the Bible. This is a reference to John the Baptist. John was a faithful servant of the Lord, raised up for a very specific purpose, and yet he was also a man who held to the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow, uh, of course, uh, uh, mandated that these individuals would refrain from touching dead bodies, the consumption of wine, and also they would refrain from cutting their hair. There are three men in Scripture that we find that actually held to a lifelong Nazarite vow, the first being Samson, that strong figure from the Old Testament, Samuel, that bold prophet, and then, of course, John the Baptist. This is John who is mentioned here in verse number two, you also see that John is a prophet of God. Luke chapter three, verse two says, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. John served as the last of the Old Testament prophets. In many ways, John the Baptist stands as the chain link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He stands there as this bold prophet of God who would not only talk about the Old Testament, but he would connect the dots and point to Jesus as the fulfillment of the old, and yet point out that Jesus is the promised one, the Christ, the Christos, the anointed one of God the Messiah. And yet, as we think about the purpose of the office of the prophet, the prophet would receive direct revelation from God. Direct revelation from God to the prophet. The prophet would then preach and communicate and write the word of God to the people of God for the glory of God. And yet we find that individuals like prophets and then, of course, coming into the New Testament, you have that same exact means of communication with the apostles. The apostles receive direct communication from God, and then they would communicate the word of God to the people of God for the glory of God. But yet when the 
the prophets died and the apostles died, then the communication changed as it pertains from God to his people. Namely because we now have the completed word of God. It was through the ministry of the prophets that we have the Old Testament. It was through the ministry of the apostles that we have the New Testament. We have the 66 completed books of the biblical canon, and so we no longer need direct revelation from God to people. Sometimes people ask the question, does God still speak? Does he still speak with authority? Does God still speak with clarity? Does God still speak sufficiently? And the answer to all of those questions is absolutely. He does so through his word. So today, as we uh, look to this passage, we see this office of prophet, and we are reminded that we no longer need direct revelation from God to man. This was reserved for specific offices like John the Baptist. So we don't need little boys dying and going to heaven, coming back to tell stories and write books that heaven is for real. We already know that because we have a sufficient book that tells us that heaven is for real and it is the word of the living God. We don't need individuals talking about sitting on their back porch like Beth Moore and others stating that they hear a fresh word from God over coffee, and then they go to conference settings and write books and stand and talk to people about what God said to them. No, we already have a fresh word from God today. It is the word of the living God. John was a prophet of God. Scholars estimate that his ministry was rather short, The preaching ministry of John the Baptist spans about six to 12 months, and yet as he was preaching, he was a powerful figure and has a powerful legacy, if you will. Consider, if you will, what Jesus said of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11. He says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist had a powerful ministry. It tells us in passages like Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And notice what it says in verse 5, and all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. All of Judea and all of Jerusalem. Obviously, the word all here is a descriptive word, meaning a whole bunch of people, not necessarily every single individual in that region, but suffice it to say, it was a lot. Scholars estimate that somewhere about 300,000 people would make their journey out to the riverside and out to the wilderness to hear John the Baptist preach. This is before the comfortable seats cooling seats, leather seats, SUVs. This is primitive transportation. This is walking a good distance. This is covering primitive road systems out into the wilderness to hear this man proclaim the gospel. Word started to spread and people started to talk and, you know, you need to go out and hear this individual preach. You need to go out and hear what, what this man is saying. And so all of these families and these individuals and these communities would make their pilgrimage, if you will, out to hear what he was saying. And he had a message to preach. John the Baptist was a prophet of God. Second of all, you'll see in verses 3 through 6, the prophet's message. First of all, you'll note there in verse number 3, it says, And he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Whatever John the Baptist was, he was a preacher. First and foremost, God raised him up to be a preacher of the Word of God. The Word of God came to John, and God raised him up to preach. The word preaching here is the word keruso. It means to make an official announcement. It means to make a proclamation. It means to herald. And it's this idea of 
of a town crier who would go out and be sent by or as an ambassador from a dignitary who would go out into the town square and would, would trumpet blast or would call out with his voice and gather the attention of the individuals in that specific city and call them to gather and he would announce a message and he would do so with the authority of the king who sent him. He would deliver the specific message, and the people were to receive the message of the herald as if the dignitary had been standing face to face with them. That was the posture. That was the seriousness. That was the, the weightiness in which the herald would, would speak. And that was exactly what you see with John the Baptist as a preacher, He was not there to dialogue with the people. He was not there to answer questions. He was not there to survey the people. He was there to proclaim, to announce. He was there to tell the message of God. Unfortunately today, preaching and the preaching of the word of God, faithful, biblical, red, hot, full throttle, full-blooded preaching has fallen on hard times in evangelical circles. Life principles and moral sappy stories are being spread about from pulpits in churches under the guise and under the banner of preaching, but it's not real preaching. Political garbage, endless how-to practical surveys, and so on and so forth. And so it is that that's the common landscape across evangelicalism today. That's not the case for this church, and I'm very grateful to be among friends today, and I'm grateful for the strong preaching that happens in this pulpit. But suffice it to say, if you go on vacation this year, and you happen to find yourself in a, in a beach town, and you just happen to be close to a church, well, there's a church. Let's just go there on Sunday. I don't really encourage you to do that, by the way. You, you might find yourself in the presence of all sorts of strange things happening under the banner of worship. And all sorts of strange things happening under the banner of preaching. And that's exactly what we find ourselves seeing across evangelicalism today. I was a Southern Baptist pastor for a number of years. We are no longer a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. That's a whole story in and of itself. And so I'm not going to bore you with that. If you're interested, I'll have a conversation about that over here after the service. But I did serve as a pastor of a Southern Baptist church for a number of years. And I can remember being the second week of June every year at the Southern Baptist Convention in a new city and yet going through that exhibit hall with hundreds of organizations and ministries on display. Pastors of Southern Baptist churches walking about taking cards and information and literature about these organizations and these ministries and seeing all of these crazy things around one corner. I remember walking around with my children one day and and there was this magician and he's doing all sorts of tricks and there's literature about how you can hire this individual to come and to do this in the context of the church. And then around another corner there was a ventriloquist and he was putting his skill on display, and there was literature there about how you could hire this individual to come to your church. And then around another corner, there was a group of individuals in really tight shirts and bulging muscles, and they were bending all sorts of things and breaking things in the name of Jesus, and you could hire them to come to your church. And yet I just stopped to ask myself, have we lost the confidence in the preaching and the proclamation of the word of the living God? Comics are entertaining, psychologists are dialoguing, social justicians are polluting, the lost are dying and perishing, and the sheep are starving. That's the landscape within evangelicalism today, and preaching has fallen on hard times. J.I. Packer, years ago, was a student who would travel in London to hear Martin Lloyd-Jones preach. And he would travel every Sunday evening and he would sit under the preaching of Martin Lloyd-Jones and he would write about his experience as a student listening to Martin Lloyd-Jones preach. And this is what J.I. Packer said. He said, the preaching of Martin Lloyd-Jones came to him with the force of an electric shock. He said, he had never heard such preaching Full-blooded, red-hot, full-throttle gospel preaching. 
What we must understand is that preaching is not talking. Preaching is not teaching. There's overlap in teaching and preaching, but preaching is distinct. That's why there are different words in the New Testament for preaching and teaching. Didasco and keruso are two different words. Preaching is the heralding of the glory of God to the people of God. William Hendrickson explains, he says, quote, Genuine preaching or heralding is a lively, not dry, timely, not stale. It is the earnest proclamation of news initiated by God, end quote. You see, if you go back and survey the Old Testament, you see that the prophets were preachers. And the apostles were preachers. And pastor teachers have an office in the goal, the job, the responsibility of a pastor is to preach the word of God. Evangelists are preachers. God's son was a preacher. And any time that you see a lack of preaching throughout church history, you see it's a dark era in church history. In fact, if you survey church history, you will always note that times of reformation and revival and awakening are marked by strong preaching. And if you go back through the Old Testament, you will see that that same thing happened in Israel's history. You will note that where there is strong preaching, there is a move towards God. And when there's a lack of emphasis on serious preaching, then there is a move of the people away from God. Martin Lloyd-Jones himself stated it this way. He said, quote, the church starts with preaching. Revivals, reformations have always been great restorations of preaching. I love to study church history, and I love, as I mentioned at the beginning, to just walk in the footsteps of men who have gone before us, men who refused to capitulate. I was here, and this is a beautiful campus, and I walked in, I walked down what's the side hallway over here, I guess known as the Reformation Hallway, with all of the portraits of the Reformers, and at the very end of the hallway, the Vartburg Castle, where Luther was in that small room with candlelight and stone floor and hardwood table, translating the Bible into the German language. But if you think about the preaching of the Reformation, those men took preaching seriously. They took preaching seriously. We should not blush, and you should never blush, by the way, about being a part of a church that takes the pulpit, the sacred desk, and the Word of God seriously. Consider, if you will, Luther's preaching. Between 1510 and 1546, Luther preached approximately 3,000 sermons, sometimes multiple sermons every single day. If you look at Calvin's preaching, he was an expositor of expositors. He began his series through Acts in 1549 and completed it in 1554. He preached 46 sermons through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 186 sermons. He preached 86 sermons through the pastoral epistles. His series through Galatians was 43 sermons. He preached 48 sermons through Ephesians. And through Job, he labored some 159 sermons. His series through Deuteronomy was 200 sermons in length. He labored through Isaiah in 353 sermons and through Genesis in 123 sermons. Uh, once upon a time, the, the city council banished Calvin from his pulpit on Easter in 1538, and he would not be allowed to return to his pulpit for some three years. And the very Lord's Day, when he was allowed back to his pulpit, he picked up in the very next verse. Now, how many of you in this room believe this morning that he just randomly opened the Bible and just happened to be that he would just preach in the very next verse from where he was when he was banished? Not a chance. He was communicating something. He was saying, I'm not finished with my work. When I was preparing to come here to preach, it was, I was informed that I needed to, to to know that Pastor Tom had, had worked for like seven years through Romans. So I said, well, I'm not preaching in Romans. The church knows Romans, right? And that's a good testimony, by the way. Verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept, 
proclaiming the word of the living God with confidence that the word of God is sufficient. Consider Spurgeon's preaching. He preached 600 sermons before he was 20. Think about that. His sermons sold approximately 25,000 copies per week and were translated into 20 languages. The collected sermons of Spurgeon fill 63 volumes, which equal to the 27-volume ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. If you're of a certain age and you stood up because you just graduated here recently and you don't know what an encyclopedia is, you can talk about that over lunch with your parents. But men like Spurgeon and Calvin and Knox and Luther, they stood on the shoulders of individuals who had gone before them, men like who? Men like John the Baptist, who took preaching seriously. John the Baptist had a message to preach, and his message involved repentance. Look at verse 3. And he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Crowds would gather around John the Baptist as he would be preaching, and he would preach a baptism of repentance. Now, what is this baptism? This is not to be confused with the ordinance of the church, the ordinance of baptism where we are identified with Christ through the water of baptism And then we are linked to and identified with God's people in the context of a local church. No, this predates that baptism. What's happening here is that the majority of the individuals who were flocking out to hear John the Baptist preach, they were Jews. The Jews had a specific ritual for a Gentile who was a proselyte of Judaism. They were to go through the rigors of and the requirements of the law... And then they were to be held to this external ritual of cleansing because the Jews looked at the Gentiles as as vile sinners who were filthy and dirty. And so one of the ways to be identified with, with the Jews publicly, externally, was to go through a ritual of washing, this baptism, this this cleansing process. All these Jews are coming out into the wilderness to hear this man who is not trying to do anything weird to draw in. He's not using gimmicks and tricks. He's just thundering the word. And all these Jews are coming out to hear John. And as they assembled, John is preaching a message of repentance, but he turns the table as a skilled prophet often would do. Remember what Nathan did in the presence of David. He told the story and caught David's heart about the little lamb. And David was so outraged. And then Nathan turns and he says, you are the man. And in this case, John the Baptist, as a skilled prophet, in in many ways is doing the very same thing. As they're out there and they're gathered to hear his message, he's preaching repentance, and then he calls the Jews to this very same ritual. You need to repent. You need to be cleansed. You need to be washed. You can't just ride Abraham's coattail into the kingdom of God. That's what John the Baptist is saying. And so he's pointing them, he's pressing them to turn. Repentance means to turn from, a change of direction. And many of these Jews had an empty religiosity. The external looks really good. They were walking, they were doing, they were engaging, they were striving in the law, but yet they were empty inside. And John looks at them and he holds them to the very same standard as the Gentiles. He is the forerunner. He is the prophet of God. He is making way for Jesus. And as he would preach, he would preach repentance, which presupposes the reality that he is calling out their guilt. He is calling out their shame. He is making it very clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Not one person that would stand there and hear John the Baptist preach would walk away feeling as if they were good in the sight of God. He was making them very clear that they were guilty in the sight of God. In fact, he would do so in such a way that he was not pulling punches. He he didn't care who was out there listening to him. In fact, Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female, young and old, everyone needs to repent. And then to, to, to make it known how serious he was, he would say, and oh, by the way, when you go back to the city, make sure that you tell Herod, send him this message, he should not have his brother's wife. Mark chapter 6, verse 18, for John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He was serious. Everyone needs to repent. Jew and Gentile. When you look at John the Baptist preaching and you see his message of repentance, his commitment to bold proclamation, there was a fire in his bones that must be delivered, a message that must be delivered. Oftentimes that's missing. The urgency is missing in modern day evangelical preaching. Sometimes I will go to a conference to speak and they'll say, well, coming next is Josh Bice and he'll be giving a talk on, and I'm not giving a talk. I'm not there to talk. There's a time for talks, and there's a time for teaching, and there's a time for Q&A. I'm certain of all of this, but in the pulpit, when the people are gathered, and especially on the Lord's Day, the people need to hear from God, and they need to hear the message of God. They need to hear the Word of God proclaimed. So I ask you this question, what about you? Do you need to repent? Do you have this external religiosity? This Sunday morning checkbox religion. I go to church. I've been to church. Is that what your religion consists of? Maybe just like those Jews who stood in front of John the Baptist today, as you sit here in this room for the very first time, you need to be confronted with the reality that your religion is about that deep and that you need to be brought to a place of repentance that you need to be called to bow to Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're here today as a guest and you're you're lost and you need to come to faith in Christ. Perhaps you're here today and you're like me. I, I was baptized in the church when I was seven years of age, but I wasn't converted until I was 25. I was an unconverted church member for years. Could it be that today that's true of you? That you need to repent. You you have religion, but religion's not enough. Listen, if that's you, then you need to repent now. You need to repent today. Spurgeon would often say, he would accent his sermons. He would say, tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is the day of repentance. And so don't delay. But not only would he preach a message of repentance, look at verse 3, preaching baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Faithful preaching doesn't stop with just talking about the wrath of God and the need to repent. Faithful preaching does not stop with the reality that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and deserve the hot vengeance of God's holy justice. That's not enough. Faithful preaching must go beyond that. Years ago, I was called out into the parking lot at our church campus, there was a contractor that was there bidding on a job and they wanted me to see what he was bidding and what his proposal was. And we were walking back into the office building. We passed by his truck that was parked right in front of the church building. And on the bumper of his truck, there was a bumper sticker that was white with black letters. And this is what it said. As he drives around all of Atlanta, Georgia, this is what it said. Jesus is coming soon. And he is real mad. That's not enough. That's not enough. It's not enough to just tell people that are pagans that they deserve the wrath of God. It is not enough to just tell them that they are guilty before God. We must do more than that. 
Years ago, I was at the Southern Baptist Convention in Indianapolis, and my friend and I were going out on lunch break, walking down the sidewalk, and as we were approaching a stoplight intersection on the sidewalk, I could see that there was an open-air preacher up in front of us at the intersection, and I could hear him preaching. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm all for that. That's great. I'm all for open-air preaching. As I got a little closer, I could notice he was holding signs, and they were a certain color, and they had a specific message, and it was all vengeance and wrath and condemnation and the judgment of God, and it was clear to me this was Westboro Baptist Church. This man had his son standing next to him, and as the cars would pull up, the light would be red, and he would just thunder and speak and yell and scream about God's wrath. We walked across the intersection, went down a barbecue on our way back. My friend was headed on. I said, I'm going to stay here for a moment. I'm going to share the gospel to this man. I started to try to engage him, and he was ignoring me. He wouldn't give me the time of day, so I was just preaching the gospel to him, and he just kept ignoring me. So I just decided the next time that the light turns red, all he's doing is talking about how God hates the wicked and God is going to bring about his holy justice and wrath and vengeance on those who are condemned. So I'm just, going to, I'm just going to preach over him. I'm going to preach about the gospel and the hope and the forgiveness of sins. So the next light turned, and he's preaching hate and vengeance and wrath and judgment. And I just started preaching over him the gospel of Jesus, that any and all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe that Jesus Christ died in your place, bled for you, suffered for you, died for you, was put in a borrowed tomb and resurrected on the third day, if you shall call upon his name, you shall receive the forgiveness of sins. Find your hope in Jesus Christ. And so that went on for a couple of lights and He was very irritated with me, and so then I started to preach to his son the gospel of Jesus, encouraging his son to reject the heresy of Westboro Baptist Church, and soon he packed up his signs and threw his stuff in the back of a white panel van and drove off. You see, that type of preaching is not enough. To just stand and tell people that they're guilty is not enough. We must do more than that. We must tell people, as John the Baptist did, he preached, he was a herald, he was a herald of repentance, and he was a herald of the forgiveness of sins. He was urging people to see that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the one who was promised of the Old Testament prophets, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And by the way, this is the preaching of Jesus as well, is it not? In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus came along and he was preaching, saying, quote, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, the euangelion, the good news, the good news. You see, if you don't preach anything but wrath and judgment and vengeance, then you don't preach good news. You're not a gospel preacher. And that was the preaching of John the Baptist. We must be preachers just like that. We must be witnesses just like that. But note also, he's preaching from Isaiah the prophet. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of One, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. As the forerunner, this prophet, John the Baptist, would look back to Genesis 3.15 as the first proclamation of the gospel, would trace all of the gospel throughout the Old Testament, throughout the, the prophets, and then point and connect the dots to Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Christ, the Christos, the one greater, the prophet greater than Moses, the priest greater than Melchizedek, and the king greater than David. This is the one. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And yet, if you look at this passage of Scripture that's here before us in Luke chapter 3, you will note that it is from Isaiah. It is 
written down some 700 years before the birth of John the Baptist and before the birth of Jesus. And yet with crystal clarity and with precision, the prophet Isaiah's words came to pass. Many scholars, by the way, when they write about Isaiah, they will oftentimes refer to Isaiah as the gospel according to Isaiah. Don't ever, when you're studying the Bible, think that the gospel just came along somewhere about the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. The gospel is from Genesis to Revelation, and it's progressively unveiled through the preaching of the prophets until we get to the introduction of Jesus, and that's exactly what this prophet was doing. In verse number four, we have a quotation from Isaiah 40, verses three through five. In, 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 in verse number five, you have a quotation from Isaiah 57, 14, and Isaiah 49, 11, and Isaiah 42, 16. In verse 6, you see a quotation from Isaiah 52.10. And again, this is, this is all coming to fulfillment. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, John the Baptist. He was to make his paths straight. That's what a forerunner would do. The envoy, the forerunner, would go before the dignitary, before the king, and would straighten out the road. Would we'll take the low spots in the road like what you find in Alabama. You know, if you're ever traveling on vacation and you cross the Georgia line and go over into Alabama, the roads just change. It's, it's miraculous how that works. Would, would raise the low spots. And then the, the, the raised spots would be brought low. And the crooked places would be straightened out. This was the job of the forerunner of the dignitary. Before the king would arrive, would sometimes go would days or even weeks ahead of time to make sure that everything was set for the arrival of the king. But not only the road and the infrastructure, but the people, that they would be ready for the arrival of the king. John MacArthur writes the following, quote, the king always had a forerunner. The king always had an entourage. The king always had some coming before him to prepare the way and make the people ready. And then was appropriately introduced by someone who bore authenticity and authority to make that introduction. That's powerful. That's heavy responsibility. And that was the whole purpose for John the Baptist's life for his ministry that was six months to 12 months in length, that he would make the way ready, that he would prepare the people for the arrival of King Jesus. He was the forerunner. But he would also warn. He would also warn the people. There was urgency here. Notice, if you will, here as the as the the forerunner of Jesus, he is, in many ways, he is saying, you need to repent and you need to turn to Jesus. You need to, you need to repent. You need to, you need to embrace him. But notice what he says here in verse number six, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is a warning. You see, not everyone in the Old Testament, not all of those prophets, they weren't able to see Jesus in the flesh. They preached, they warned, they proclaimed. Here, you find that John the Baptist is able to see the salvation of God. But what about you and what about me? We haven't yet seen Christ, but we have this promise that he is coming. We have this promise that, that Christ will come. We have this promise that, that he will come again. Therefore, Philippians chapter 2 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, that is true. And one of these days, when the king comes, every eye shall behold him. 
And those who are on the left shall be cast off into everlasting torment, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth under the judgment, the eternal wrath of God. But to all that are on his right hand shall be welcomed into his kingdom as the children of the most high God who were purchased with his blood. You see, every eye, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Yes, it will cost you to stand for Jesus. In this, in this soul diminishing evil age in which we live where darkness prevails and the worldly ideologies are so prevalent, it will cost you to stand for Jesus. I ask you, will you be like a John the Baptist? Will you stand flat-footed without compromise, without capitulation, and will you boldly declare and be a witness, an ambassador for Jesus Christ? Will that be what you are known for? Or will you be someone who's just willing to have that checkbox religion I went to church on Sunday, but I'm not really dangerous like John the Baptist. We need to be able to stand and say with Martin Luther, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. Are you, are you in Christ today? If you have never bowed to Jesus, I urge you even now to repent of your sins and to turn to Jesus Christ and to be saved. Spurgeon once preached a sermon on the Lord's Day. The sermon's title was Now. 173 times he thundered across that pulpit to that church. Now. Now is the appropriate time. Now you are under the wrath of God. Now you stand under the judgment of God. Now you need to be saved. I ask you this question. Will you come to Christ now? Will you embrace Jesus now? Will you cast yourself upon the mercy of God now? Will you be saved now?